sausage, junk food. Could it be healthier than anything green that's on your plate? Yeah, that's what we're going to find out today. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. This is the exam room live now watched and downloaded in more than 150 countries, making this one of the most downloaded nutrition podcasts anywhere on the planet today. And today we are talking about the idea of individualized diets. So could there ever be any scenario in any situation where junk food, including sausage, could trump something like spinach or kale or carrots to become king of your healthy domain. We're going to find out when we talk about personalized diets with two-time New York Times bestselling author, Dr. Will Bolsowitz. He is here with us today on the exam room live, and we're also going to be opening up the doctor's mailbag. So if there's something that you would like to ask Dr. B, go ahead and drop that in the comments or in the chat. You can also hit me up on Twitter or Instagram. Send me your questions there. Flood that doctor's mailbag, and we're going to get to as many of those questions as we possibly can. We already have some great ones about universally healthy meals. We've got questions about about eating for your blood type, so many others. So go ahead, stuff the mailbag with your questions, and we will get you an answer if we can here on the show today. And with that, let's talk about sausage and broccoli. And welcome Dr. Will Bolsowitz back to the exam room live. My friend, good to see you again. Good to see you, Chuck. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk about sausages. <laughs> it's kind of, a, we're picking up where we left off last time. Um, so the other day, I was flipping through Instagram and I came upon something that you had posted where you actually <laughs> pondered this very question to the hundreds of thousands of followers that you have. It was basically, could sausage be healthier than broccoli depending on basically your makeup? So we're talking about individualized or personalized diets here. And I'm just going to ask you flat out, is there any situation on God's green earth where sausage could be healthier than broccoli this is the this is what i have become <laughs> i spent 16 <laughs> years training myself to become a medical doctor so that i could do social media posts about sausages <laughs> versus broccoli <laughs> because there are people that, i mean it, it's absolutely crazy to believe that there are people who sincerely think I, I mean i think they're being sincere that it's possible that a sausage could be healthier than broccoli this is why i felt compelled to do this post like you know, here's the thing. Let's start with this. Here's the framework. Nutrition is not one size fits all. Uh, Chuck, there's overwhelming evidence that the way that different people respond to the exact same food is different, right? So there's a different way you could give you and I the exact same meal. We're not going to have the exact same response in our body to that meal. Maybe that seems completely obvious. I don't know. But that's the truth. So there is no one size fits all. So then that raises the question is nutrition just a total free for all? Meaning that there are some people where eating sausage is going to be healthier than broccoli. And the answer is a resounding absolutely not. Absolutely not. That it's more like report card grades, right? Broccoli is going to either be an A plus, an A, or an A minus for you. I can't see any world where broccoli could possibly be anything less than an A minus, maybe someone out there has a B plus on it. It's not going to be a C. It's never going to be a D or ever an F. But sausage, like could sausage be an A for someone? Absolutely not. Sausage in your best case scenario is a C minus. If, you, if you're someone who loves sausage, you would be lucky if sausage is a C minus for your health. Most people's sausage is going to be a D or enough. So there is no world in which sausage is actually going to be healthier than eating broccoli for a normal human being. Now, let me, let me say this, because, because the problem is when we speak on absolute terms, people always, there's always gonna be someone who freaks out and they're going to present some specific scenario that has absolutely nothing to do with the real, real world in which we exist and live. And they're going to present this scenario and say, but doesn't this mean that sausage could be healthier for this person? Okay, so if we take a person who's living in starvation and they have a choice, it's one meal, <laughs> sausage or broccoli. For one meal, the sausage is higher in calories and that person is living in starvation. And therefore, from a nutritional perspective, they need calories. 
So in the short term, sausage would be a better choice. But if you're telling me that they have access to food over 50 years, 70 years, well, then clearly they're not living in starvation anymore because they have access to food and they've lived 50 or 70 years. And in that case, there's absolutely no world where sausage is going to be healthier than broccoli for long-term consumption, period. All right. So you're talking about that in terms of grades. And so now I'm thinking like Dr. B's on a roll, right? So now you've got broccoli, which is head of the class, probably the kind of student that wants to sit in that front row and his teacher's pet. And then you've got sausage, which is the student who's chilling in the back of the class, head buried down, doing their best not to get acknowledged whatsoever. They're just kind of there and they're not going to make that honor roll. They're going to graduate possibly, but it's certainly not going to be with honors. Well, and they haven't taken a shower either. That's the other thing. About <laughs> so, <laughs> don't be that kid. Don't be. <laughs> don't be that kid. Oh man, is that true though? Like literally for all kinds of meats. Like so, I know like sausage. Obviously, that's a processed meat, so that goes into the class one carcinogen group. But then other people say, well, look, you know, like a lean chicken breast is healthier than sausage. Could that possibly uh, be that C student or even a B or an A student? Well, again, I think with all these things, you're going to, um, if we're going to assign a report card grade or potential report card grades to these students, they're going to vary, right? So nutrition at the end of the day, um, to step outside of the analogy for a moment and just kind of speak frankly to our audience who's hanging out with us right now, nutrition ultimately is about substitutions. What are you replacing with what? In every single nutritional study, the question is, what are you replacing with what? So we can do research that makes butter appear to be healthy. And it's a mirage because butter like is not something that we should be gravitating towards and adding more of in our diet. But if you compare butter to, for example, partially hydrogenated fat, which <laughs> was actually taken off the market because it caused so much coronary artery disease. It's literally the least healthy food that exists to the point that it was withdrawn from the U.S. food market. Um, if you're going to make that comparison, butter compared to that, well, then butter appears to be more healthy. That doesn't mean that butter is actually a healthful food. So when we think about meat, if we're going to talk about meat specifically, look, we have to, if, if we're going to talk about meat, we have to put fish, shellfish at the top. Those are going to be the healthiest. Are they an A or an A plus? That's very hard to say. They may be for those. But the point with those, from my perspective, has never been, can you be healthy and consume some fish? The point with those, from my perspective, has always been, look at how much we have decimated this ocean during our lifetime, Chuck. And you and I are not that old. Look at how much, look at what we've done to this ocean. And now we have 8 billion people on this planet. And if everyone goes pescatarian, there will be no ocean. There will be no fish. Right. So that really is not an option for the masses. So anyway, chicken is going to be below that eggs in there somewhere. We were talking about meat, but I'm throwing eggs in there somewhere. Um, but then you get down to red meat and then below that, the processed meats. And that's sort of the totem pole or hierarchy that exists. I don't know that chicken chicken certainly is not going to be an A. I, I don't know where to, what kind of grade to assign to it. it kind of depends on you know the framework of these other things but i think that the bottom line is that ultimately at the end of the day what are you replacing with what if you're eating chicken instead of eating a salami sandwich you've made a better choice but i'd rather you have beans that's the way i feel right hey man nothing wrong with beans i agree with you though about the oceans just a quick side note you know my mom growing up she worked for the Cousteau society so from a very young age i was kind of involved in ocean cleanup and and uh eco sustainability and uh, to think back, you know, 35 or 40 years now, gosh, I'm getting old, man, uh, to where we were then yep. to where we are today. And we thought that we were in a bad spot 40 years ago. I mean, we would take 40 years ago where we are now, like no question and think that it was it was a great thing. So I, I agree with you 100 um, percent with where you stand with that. Um, let's take a follow up question, though, from Smitty here. Um, it's kind of the natural progression in this. So Smitty's wondering, how does personalized nutrition differ from the concept of eating for your blood type? Does that factor in? Well, the, the difference is the, the level of evidence that has demonstrated that it's real. So eating for your blood type, um, they have studied this. So the 
sort of idea gets released, people start eating for their blood type. And then after the fact, they do the study to say, is this like, is there any merit to this after the fact, right? The fad has already taken off. And what they discover is that there's one specific dietary pattern within the blood type diet that actually appears to be the healthiest. And that's type A. People who are type A and they eat a type A diet, they do better. Guess what? People who are not type A and they eat a type A diet, they do better. Everyone does better on a type A diet. Well, guess what the type A diet is? It's a plant-based diet. So basically, it just demonstrated that independent of what blood type you have, if you eat a more plant-based diet, you are going to get better results. When it comes to personalized nutrition, we're talking about something different than that. Personalized nutrition is not coming up with some sort of fad idea. Personalized nutrition, at least as I'm involved with it, is conducting rigorous scientific research, research that um, will be accepted on peer review at the top journals in the entire planet, because that's what we've been doing. Uh, for the, by the way, for people who are wondering, like, when he says we and what we're doing, what is he referring to? Well, I'm I'm referring to my work with a company called Zoe. It's a personalized nutrition company, and I'm, I'm their U.S. medical director. And I'm involved with this company because I sincerely believe that this is legitimate and real. We have research to back it up. We've published more than 40 papers. And the, the point is that if you take people and you analyze their microbiome and what they're eating and their blood sugar and their blood lipids, if you take all of that information and you get enough people, not a hundred people, not a thousand people, tens of thousands of people, you get all of that information and you allow these supercomputers to run complex machine learning algorithms, they will define exactly what grade you're going to give to broccoli. Is it an A plus, an A, or an A minus? But again, broccoli is never going to be a C or a D. So at the end of the day, personalized nutrition, this is where we're moving. It's going to keep getting better. We're just getting started. It's, you know, like literally we're just getting started. But ultimately, this is going to help us to understand the way that we work in terms of our biology and also what works for us on an individual basis as opposed to more of a general audience. Let's do an exam roomy roll call here. El Casas checking in live with us for the very first time. Been watching the show since January. Says it's always helpful information. That's awesome. Thanks for raising your health IQ with us, El Casas. Uh, B is checking in. Love the podcast. Thank you so much, B. Uh, and then JK Sampley uh, at 11.59. Dr. B, I credit you and your cookbook for transforming my gut health and helping to restore my voice. No more heavy mucus in my vocal cords as long as I track histamine levels. Thank you. Well, that's a heck of a compliment, man. Oh, that is amazing. I'm so excited by this. Thank you. Um, thank you, JK Sampley, for saying this. That's, I mean, this, this is, Chuck, this is the reason why I get excited to do things like write a book. Because what's amazing is that I could spend a year of my life writing a book by myself, but using my education, using my experience, and trying to put into words a framework that I think can help people. And it's just the best is you push it out into the world. My book came out in May. And to hear like already here we are and it's only two months later. And this person is saying that the book changed their life. Like this is the reason why you do it. That's amazing. That's so cool. Absolutely. Oh, I'd love to hear that. I love to hear that so much. Uh, Heidi, watching live instead of this afternoon. All right. Well, thanks for sneaking us in your schedule, Heidi. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, let's take a question from Joanna. We've been talking about broccoli. Joanna's wondering about uh, broccoli sprouts. At 11.51, this one was on YouTube before we even got going. Does eating broccoli sprouts have any additional benefits to eating, say, a pound of regular broccoli every day? Well, a pound of regular broccoli every day, man, that is a lot. <laughs> and if you're eating that much broccoli, it makes me honestly a little bit nervous that you're not eating enough of other stuff. Variety is the key to a healthy gut microbiome. Um, so we don't want to overly emphasize or disproportionately emphasize one specific food. This may be a bit controversial, but I'm just going to say it. I would rather you eat five average plant-based foods, not the stuff that we're putting up on a pedestal and calling it a superfood. Five average plant-based foods. I would rather you eat that than that one superfood in an excessive amount. Uh, that being said, the question was about broccoli sprouts versus broccoli. Broccoli sprouts do have benefits. 
it's not the exact same thing. You're catching the same food at a different stage in its life cycle. A broccoli seed turns into a broccoli sprout, it germinates, and you're catching it within the first week of life, um, as opposed to mature broccoli, which is certainly many weeks, if not months later. Um, the broccoli sprout has 50 to 100 times more of a phytochemical that we call sulforaphane. And sulforaphane is the most powerful cancer-fighting phytochemical that I have ever come across. It has tremendous anti-inflammatory properties. It's not just a cancer thing. And so when we consume the broccoli sprout, we're getting far higher levels of that. So 50 to 100 times uh, more than mature broccoli in terms of the sulforaphane. Let's think about this. If you have 16 ounces of broccoli, an entire pound, that's what we're talking about here. You could divide that by 50 or a hundred, right? So it could be, you know, it could be 0.16 ounces or 0.32 ounces. And that's the amount of broccoli sprouts that you need to eat to get the exact same amount of sulforaphane. Here's the point. That's not a lot of broccoli sprouts. So if you eat a, a handful of broccoli sprouts, you're actually getting more of this fighter, this cancer they're fighting phytochemical than you would an entire pound of broccoli. So get the broccoli sprouts in there, get some other stuff in there. Let's mix it up. Let's get variety. You're a sprout kind of a guy though. Uh, by and large, would you say that sprouted foods tend to be a little bit more nutrient dense than others? Oh, definitely. Nutrient dense in the sense that if we're, you know, when we talk about nutrient dense, we're talking about the amount of nutrients that you get per weight or per calorie. And, you know, the beautiful thing, what's exciting about sprouts is that you're taking advantage in nature where you initiate germination. Germination is when the sprouting happens. It goes from a seed into a sprout. When you do this, you are radically increasing the amount of fiber, radically increasing the amount of protein. You are creating new vitamins, believe it or not, there's new vitamins, more access to, to minerals and other nutrients. And then there's these other phytochemicals, like I was just mentioning sulforaphane, but there's other examples. The point is we're talking about some of the most nutritious food that exists and the vast majority of people are not consuming sprouts as a routine part of their diet. I'm not advocating for an exclusively sprout fed diet, although that's what Doug Evans does. I'm, or, or he's like predominantly uh, sprout based. I'm advocating that you take a person who's not eating sprouts and you start sprouting because it is so good for you. But sprouts, though, I mean, just from a culinary standpoint, they are versatile. I mean, you can put sprouts on top of a salad. You can put them in a wrap. You can do a sandwich thing with them. You can do all kinds of things with sprouts. All, I mean, literally all kinds of sprouts. Super versatile, super tasty, too. I mean, nutrient dense, taste dense, too. It's not like it's this flavorless food. So you really get a lot of bang for your buck. If I had my own personal food on a roll in terms of health, I'm going to put, I'm definitely going to consider sprouts to be an a plus student right they have to be on that dean's list yeah have yeah to they're gonna be they're gonna those are gonna be healthful foods and and when you sprout food um what we find is that it's even more healthy than the for, fully mature food in most cases That's so, so like lentil sprouts lentil sprouts i mean let me tell you something about lentil sprouts okay i i kind of lose my mind when i start talking about them because they're amazing you take a half of a cup of lentils. And by the way, someone asked in the chat, they said, can you just buy the you know stuff that you get at the store? No, you're going to want stuff that is designed for high germination rate. So it's designed for sprouting. You want it to be organic. And you also want it to um, be tested for contaminants. So, and that's, this is why you want to buy specifically sprouting seeds. But if you take a half of a cup of organic sprouting lentils, which by the way, this probably costs you 25 cents. I'm not kidding. Okay. Half of a cup of these lentils in three days will turn into four cups, eight times more, four cups of lentil sprouts that are higher in fiber, higher in protein, higher in nutrients, easier on the gut to digest and process. Okay. So lentils are a superfood. Then what do we even call lentil sprouts? It's like off the charts. It's amazing. That would be a super duper food, my friend, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, this is, this is, you know, this is part of the point is that 
Um, one of the big criticisms that people will make of a plant-based diet is they'll say it's not accessible. It's not accessible. They'll say it's too expensive and you can't, there's these food deserts and people who live in food deserts can't get this. Well, I completely get where they're coming from. And there certainly is truth to what they're saying. But a plant-based diet is not only fresh produce that you get from the organic section of whole foods. That is not what a plant-based diet is. A plant-based diet is built on a backbone of whole grains and legumes. And what I'm saying with the lentil sprouts is that even for people who can't afford uh, a whole foods diet from whole foods that it's organic, you can get organic lentil sprouts and you can make them at home. A half a cup turns into four cups of food in three days with very little effort. So there are these options that exist that are extremely cost effective and simultaneously the most nutritious food on the planet. You think you could get those organic lentil sprouts on Amazon? I mean, it's prime day and if they're already kind of, you know, really cheap and then you discount those even further, I mean, you're really doing pretty good for yourself, man. Where do you get yours? Uh, there's, there's a couple of places. I'm not, by the way, I don't, um, I like to be upfront and say like, I'm not endorsing any specific company. Um, but there is True Leaf Market. Um, there's Johnny's Seeds. There's a couple. If you search for sprouting, um, sprouting seeds or sprouting legumes, you will find them. And I'm I'm actively on. I'm not going to do a share screen, uh, but I'm actively in. Uh, I'm actively on Amazon right now, and they do in fact have the availability of organic sprouting lentils or other sprouts whether or not they're on sale for prime day is a different question i don't you know I'm, I'm not totally clear on that but but they are available on amazon for those that are interested and you know what let me tell you something real quick chuck i don't mean to be completely off topic but since we're talking about prime day but since we're talking about prime day in amazon i discovered last night number one that i had a ridiculous number of american express points <laughs> i didn't even know i had them right so i found out that i had a ridiculous number of american express points and then number two, I found out that they work on Amazon and you can use them. So I'm really excited because I took advantage of Prime Day and my kids are going to, we're, we're going to do some camping soon. That's that's a little preview. Giddy up, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. I love that, man. Yeah, dude. Uh, yeah. Credit card points. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. Um, so Pete Caldwell, this is an interesting question at 1214. Pete's like, all right, guys. I got you. Now, here's the hypothetical of all hypotheticals. The question is, someone who eats no animal products, would they be healthier? Uh, I'm sorry. Who would be healthier? Someone who eats no animal products and no greens or someone who eats animal products and lots of greens? What's the healthier scenario? Well, it depends on how much animal products we're talking about here. So I don't really love the idea of eliminating greens. Greens are like literally some of the healthiest foods that exist on the planet. We're talking about all greens are all nutrients, no calories. It's like, it's almost like you are feeding and fueling and nourishing your body, but without adding any calories. I mean, it's just so fascinating how powerful greens are and recognizing some, some of the challenges that we have from a metabolic perspective in the United States, greens absolutely need to be a part of a healthful, health food, healthful diet. The average American eats 220 pounds of animal products per year. 220 pounds. That's more than the average American's body weight. So are we talking about 220 pounds of meat plus some greens? That to me is not a healthful diet period. I don't like, it's impossible for me to sign off on that. If you're telling me that you reduce your animal products, like significantly where you are consuming animal products occasionally by occasionally, I don't mean every single day. I instead mean most days you're consuming a healthful plant-based diet. And once in a while you'll have some animal products and that includes greens. That's a healthful diet. That's a healthful diet. There is no doubt that if you take your animal product consumption, you substantially reduce it, but you don't completely eliminate it. That is still a healthful diet. When you get to that point, the strongest argument in favor of the complete elimination of animal products is the ethical concerns. The ethical concerns in terms of the animals, in terms of the environment, in terms of what kind of planet are we going to leave to our kids and our grandkids. And many people who make this transition, myself included, 
you get along the transition, you're doing it for health reasons, and you come to a certain point where you go, you know, I think I want to do this for the ethical reasons too. And I think that's a powerful thing, but we all have our own sort of journey and story of what brings us there. So here's some exciting news here uh, for Prime Day. Uh, the Fiber Fueled Cookbook is discounted, my friends. It is uh, discounted um, down to eighteen ninety, down from a list price of thirty. Man, so go ahead. Today is a great day to pick up your copy of the Fiber Fueled Cookbook. Hop on that. Uh, it wow, is awesome. Wow, they still that's yeah, man. That's great, man. And you know, order today, get it tomorrow. How about that? You can't beat it. Um, all right. The award for the best screen name of the day goes to a gentleman who posted at 1225. Mark me words has a question for you at 1225. Which is preferable, cooked or raw sprouts? Or is there not much of a difference at all? Um, it depends on the individual sprout that we're referring to and what the specific benefits that we're trying to get. So if you cook broccoli sprouts at high heat, you're going to get rid of uh, and destroy the enzymes that you need to get access to the sulforaphane. This is part of the issue. So generally speaking, generally speaking, raw sprouts are preferred. There you go. Uh, uh, let's question from 1226. Can we sprout the available lentil in the market, which is not organic? And why do you recommend organic only? Well, uh, in the market, so in the market, meaning your supermarket. So can you sprout those? I would not recommend it. I would not recommend it. And the reason why, independent of the organic question, which I will address in a moment, is that those lentils, first of all, they're not high germination. So you're going to have weak returns on your sprouting efforts. And second of all, quite importantly, they haven't been tested for bacterial contaminants or pathogens. Now, the thing about sprouting is that you're taking either a seed or a legume and you're then unpacking it and you're opening it up. And microbes are a part, a healthy and normal part of this process. Microbes are a part of this process. But if hypothetically the sprout or the, the I'm sorry, the legume or the seed was contaminated with, say, E. coli, what you're going to do when you actually germinate it is that E. coli is going to multiply and become more pronounced. And you consume it and then you get sick. Not life-threatening, but something that we're not trying to actually have happen. We're trying to be smart about this. Um, you do hear about the safety issues surrounding sprouts and the safety issues, it's classically with commercial, uh, commercial sprouts, especially alfalfa sprouts that show up in Jimmy John's sandwiches. But there's still a chance that home sprouting can potentially be problematic and so from a food safety perspective, I recommend that you buy specifically sprouting seeds that have been tested for contaminants to reduce the likelihood, not completely eliminate, but reduce the likelihood of this happening. Doug Evans is actively working on, and if you haven't bought Doug Evans' book, you should buy it as well. It's called The Sprout Book. He's actively working on research to take a look into how we can sterilize our legumes and our seeds prior to sprouting them at home. So this is something that would help help to diminish those risks even further. But a good starting point is to get something that's been tested. Now, as for organic, when it comes to organic, the problem is that many things that are not organic have been sprayed with glyphosate. And there's different reasons why something might be sprayed with glyphosate. In the case of legumes, part of the reason is that they get dried out. So you can actually dry out the legume faster by spraying it with glyphosate. So if you're talking about lentils, I'm concerned that if you buy the what's available at the store, that you have something that's contaminated with this chemical that we don't want to expose our body to um, if it's not organic. Whereas if it's organic, then you know it's never been sprayed with glyphosate. Uh, Edith is looking for some practical advice. You do some sprouting in your house. She says that uh, her sprouts always get yucky after a few days. She's wondering how you store yours to keep them fresh as long as possible. Well, you want to, what you want is you want your sprout supply. You want to eat them as, as, um, soon after you harvest them by harvest. It basically just means opening up the jar or and take them out of the jar. You want to eat them as soon after you harvest them as possible. They can be good for up to a week. You would contain that. You would um, keep them inside of a container. And typically I will mildly moisten a paper towel, not drench it mildly moisten a paper towel and then wrap the sprouts in it just to create a little bit of humidity and moisture within the container. 
and I'll keep them in a glass container for up to a week. And then I discard them. I don't, I don't eat sprouts after a week after they've been in the fridge. But I also try to tailor my sprout consumption to, or I'm sorry, my sprout production to my sprout consumption. So I try to create a match. I don't want to have a excessive amount of sprouts that I'm producing relative to the amount that I'm actually going to eat. So I mentioned a moment ago, a half of a cup of lentils turns into four cups of lentil sprouts. If your entire family is going to enjoy these lentil sprouts, you could do this once a week or more and you will consume them. But if you're the only one that's eating them, this is a lot of lentil sprouts unless you are making this a big emphasis or focus within your diet. If that's the case, reduce the amount that you start with. So in that case, I start with a quarter of a cup of lentil sprouts, and that will still produce two cups of lentil sprouts for me that I'm ready to consume, hopefully in the next three, four or five days after they're, after they're ready. All right. Big Greg five at 1223. I think big Greg here is trying to troll and have a little bit of fun. Uh, just kind of having fun with the title of the episode. Yeah. But what about broccoli sausage? We were talking about could sausage ever be healthier than broccoli. Now look, look at me here, Greg, here's, here's the score. You may not be that far off joking though. You may be because you can make one heck of a hot dog out of a carrot and you know, some seasoning. We could theoretically somehow figure out the proper herbs and spices and make some sausage out of broccoli. I'm telling you. And take that from a guy who really enjoyed sausage more than most at 420 pounds, right? I know my sausage. And I am confident that somehow, some way, we could indeed come up with a healthy sausage broccoli. So, Greg, nice try, buddy. I see what you're up to, but I accept your challenge. That's all I have to say about that. One of the things, <laughs> yeah, no, I love that because well, because one of the things is that you can recreate the flavors that you really dig from sausage, and really, it's about the herbs and the seasonings, right? So, if you get the right herbs and seasonings, and you and you take something that's, for example, proteinaceous, um, like tempeh, so you could take tempeh and create something that's almost like a sausage um, crumble. Right. And so, and you, you can do this with the right spices. And it's actually one of the recipes that I have in my course right now, the plant fed gut masterclass um, is doing that. Now, the other choice, by the way, is the, the meat alternatives, which are things like uh, beyond meat. And to me, this is not like I, I you are clearly better off eating a carrot dog than eating a beyond meat brat. But they actually did, Professor Christopher Gardner at Stanford, um, one of the leading nutrition uh, researchers, did a study comparing Beyond Meat burgers head to head with organic, organic, grass-fed red meat burgers. And what he discovered, this is not a claim that the Beyond Meat burger is a health food, but relative to the organic grass-fed burger, there were some major things that were advantageous about the Beyond Meat Burger, including, perhaps most importantly, that it did not raise TMAO at all, whereas the Red Meat Burger did. And TMAO has been connected to increased risk of heart disease, cardiovascular events, stroke, uh, chronic kidney disease, several of the top 10 causes of death ultimately have been connected back to TMAO. We don't want more of it. And when you eat the Beyond Meat burger, you actually reduce your exposure to it relative to the organic grass-fed burger. So just something to be aware of. Again, like I would rather you have a bean burger, but. Right on. Uh, dog lover. All right. This is one that I'm sure a lot of people are wondering about. What are your go-to grab and go snacks? How do you keep it healthy when you're on the run, Dr. B? Uh, for, so mornings, fruit. I th like I think we underestimate fruit. I'm, what I'm talking about is like grabbing you know, grabbing an apple and an orange or a banana, throwing that into a bag. And when you get hungry, you're trying to avoid toxic hunger. You're trying to avoid a situation where it's 12 or 1230 and you're ravenous and you're going to just devour something that's completely unhealthy. So if that's the case, having a piece of fruit at 11 or 1130, that's a great thing. Whole fruit is healthful food. Um, afternoons, I'm a big fan of um, uh, seeds and nuts. And then the other thing is like dips. So hummus, like hummus and carrots is incredibly healthy. And it is just as tasty. You get the crunch, you get the creamy hummus, just as tasty as using, for example, pita chips, but way more healthy. So hummus and carrots for the win. 
Oh, I eat that every day. You and I are on the same wavelength there, my friend. Absolutely. Every single day. Can't go a day without it. That's kind of become my taco bill. Um, question from Terry at 1234. How are microgreens different from sprouts? Maybe a few others wondering that one as well. Okay. So when we do sprouts, sprouting is the very, very first stage of germination. It does not require soil or any sort of matrix for the plants to like root down and grow. So, um, so sprouts are going from seed or legume to very first stage sprout. The stage after the sprout is the microgreen. And typically entering into the stage, the plant needs some sort of place to root down. So this could be soil, but it could also be like you see that the, there's like a paper matrix that um, there are microgreen kits and the seed again grows it goes through the sprouting phase and then it grows up it roots down and the paper matrix is helping to create what it needs in order to root down and then you snip it and that's the microgreen they're very similar i don't think that there's one that's more healthy than the other it, it'd be minor differences between the two they're both great check this out 1237 from high car beth i had broccoli with chili sauce last night it was very much like sausage so there you go it's not just a theory. It is reality, my yeah, friend. I guess what grade she gets for that. She gets an A plus for that. That's so. right. <laughs> Gold star, front of the class. Well done, Beth. Uh, Jake's checking in from uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. Hey, man. Thanks for checking us out. Uh, two more quick ones. Uh, we'll go rapid fire. Zoe is wondering uh, what your opinion is on bean pastas. Are they okay? There seems to be more fiber in them. Um, I think that, so, okay, I would rather you eat beans than bean pastas, right? But I think that bean pastas, recognizing that the average American consumes six pounds of beans per year total, right? I, I said earlier, 220 pounds of meat. Uh, I think it's something like 70 pounds of, of sugar, 30 something pounds of cheese, and the average American eats six pounds of beans. So making substitutions that get more legumes into the diet one way or another, I declare victory on that. So, and that could be these legume based pastas could be a, a bean burger, you know, even one that you bought at the store and you're not making it from scratch as a patty, you bought it at the store and that's a bean burger. I declare victory, but I also want you to get more legumes in general. We've been talking about legume sprouts, like lentil sprouts, great place for a start for you to start. And I want to end with something completely different from everything else we've been talking about today. I just find this question so interesting. Andrea actually sent me this one on Instagram a while back. She wanted to know how microbiome can affect mental health. Is there a connection between the two? What do you know? Uh, there is a connection. We're learning a lot more about this. We're actually in the process through Zoe. I mentioned that we're doing clinical research. We've published over 40 papers. I'm actually involved in a study right now. I don't have results to report. But we're in the process of taking a look specifically at how food uh, affects microbes, affects mood. So Chuck, the, the, the quick point of it is that we know that food affects mood. Uh, there was a study that was out of the Food and Mood Center in Australia where um, Professor Felice Jacka, it was called the SMILES trial. And basically she showed that food actually could be as effective as medication for mild to moderate depression. What was this magical food? It was a, a plant-based Mediterranean diet. Like not plant exclusive, but a plant predominant Mediterranean diet as good as medication for treating mood. More recently, that was several years ago. More recently, we have data showing us that there's differences in the microbiome of people who suffer with um, major depression or generalized anxiety disorder. And the differences that exist, you see more inflammatory microbes and you see less of the anti-inflammatory short chain fatty acid producing microbes. It starts to make sense. A high fiber, you know, predominantly plant-based Mediterranean diet, if that's what you want to lean into because of that smiles trial, but a high fiber diet feeds, fuels, lifts up a healthy gut microbiome. And we have randomized controlled trials in terms of increasing dietary fiber and improving mood as well. So the connection is there. There's still a lot for us to learn. And I'm actually actively working on this right now.
Ah, man, I can't wait to keep up with this research. I think there's a lot of people that can benefit from that, man. So keep up the great work. Uh, one more quick recipe from the peanut gallery. Uh, Peace Weaver says that uh, they make whole food, plant-based, no oil mushroom sausage patties. You can get creativity. I mean, I absolutely love the creativity that people have in the kitchen. And then they bring all of that to the exam room with them. And it's just, it's so cool, man. If you ever have the chance to join us live, if you're watching this on demand or you're listening to the podcast right now, set a reminder for Wednesdays at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Hop over to the Physicians Committee's YouTube channel or Facebook page. Join us live, hop in the chat room, raise your health IQ with the other exam roomies. And then uh, the second Tuesday of every month, Really, I mean, don't just mark your calendars. Get a big fat red sharpie and circle that because that's when Dr. Bolsowitz is making house calls with us, man. It's been really good to have you here today. Uh, and again, the fiber fueled cookbook is uh, discounted right now for Prime Day, thirty seven percent off, my friends. You see it right there on the screen, thirty seven percent off. Hop on Amazon, pick up your copy of the fiber fueled cookbook if you have not already done so. Dr. Bolsowitz, thank you, my friend. This has been enlightening as always. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you for the active uh, engagement in the chat box. And we'll see you guys again sometime soon. Keep checking out the live sessions. There he goes, the Sultan of Sprouts. Hey, uh, listen, quick, exciting announcement. If you uh, want to join us August 18th through the 20th right here in Washington, D.C. for the International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine, we will be recording episodes of the exam room live all three days. So if you ever want to watch the show in person, hang out with some other roomies, ask questions of the doctor literally in person, we would love to see you there. That's Washington, D.C., August 18th through the 20th. Going to have 30 speakers uh, at that conference over the course of those three days. I mean, just a few of the names. Dr. Neil Barnard will be there. Dr. Dean Ornish is presenting. Dr. Alan Desmond. Dr. Kim Williams. So many others uh, all presenting the latest on uh, nutrition and health, all things that you need to know. And if you happen to work uh, in the medical community, you need some CME credits, we can hook you up with those as well. So you see that right there on the screen, pcrm.org slash ICNM, August 18th through the 20th. Hope to see you there, my friend. Only a few seats available uh, remaining if memory does serve. So book yours today. But for today, that is all the time that we have, my friends. I want to say thank you once again to Dr. B for being here and helping to raise our health IQs, talking broccoli and sausage and personalized diets and all kinds of healthy things. Really, really cool. And that, by the way, is why uh, sausage will never be healthier than broccoli, unless it's broccoli sausage. Anyway, we'll ponder that another day. Uh, thank you to the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen. Thank you, guys. And to you, exam roomies, thank you all so very much for hanging out and making the show uh, the fun thing that it is. And for everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again next time. But until then, keep it plant-based.